cough over the course of the day has been treated with Regeneron and is expected to be going to Walter Reed Medical Center for more tests. Let's go to our chief White House correspondent, John Carl. George, uh, we are told that the president has, ha has all of the classic symptoms of coronavirus, or many of them, fever, chills, nasal congestion, and a cough. Uh, the White House has not confirmed this trip to Walter Reed yet, but they have released a statement from his doctor uh, saying the president remains fatigued, but in good spirits, as he mentioned, uh, taking Regeneron, also taking a series of, uh, of vitamins and, and, and a daily aspirin. They say that the first lady also has a mild cough and head Headache. That's what we know officially from the White House right now, awaiting word on, on this trip to Walter Reed. Okay, let's get more from our senior medical editor, Dr. Jan Ashton. So, Dr. Dr. Jan, what we know now is that fever, as John said, the classic symptoms. Also, this uh, a single 8-gram dose of Regeneron's polyclonal antibody cocktail. That's according to the president's physician. Tell us what that says to you. Well, I think the first thing to understand, George, is that the president's physician and his team of consultants are going to be making an assessment on things like how the blood oxygen level is, the vital signs, fever, chills, um, whether or not they might need other specialized care like an anesthesiologist or respiratory therapist or intensivist. Um, when you talk about this experimental cocktail of polyclonal antibodies, it's really interesting. This is a potential breakthrough treatment for patients in an out-of-hospital setting who may be thought to be at an increased risk of not being able to mount their own immune response um, has been shown in clinical trials to shorten the duration of symptoms and reduce the amount of virus circulating in the body. Um, so it does tell you that they made a calculated risk assessment of risk versus benefits and the benefits outweigh the risk of giving this drug and that the, the benefits of moving the president to Walter Reed outweighed the risks of staying at the White House. And Dr. Chen, stand by because we actually have the, the, one of the founders of Regeneron who created this polyclonal antibody cocktail, Dr. George Yankopoulos, on the phone with us as well. Uh, Dr. Yankopoulos, tell us about the significance of the 8-gram dose and what you've seen so far in your results. First, I should just correct one thing. It's a cocktail of monoclonal antibodies. So it's a monoclonal antibody cocktail. Uh, uh, the I White House called it medical, polyclonal. I, I think that that was just uh, an error in, in transcription. Okay. Um, and I think that your correspondent described it well. I, I, I'm sure that, as she said, the medical consultants looked at all the data and decided that this, because of its... Uh, apparently uh, strong data suggesting antiviral activity, lowering of the virus, and potential to help people exactly in this situation. They deemed that based on the risk benefit, it'd be worth trying it. Uh, we tested two doses in our trial. Uh, they went with the high dose, uh, and I guess, once again, they assessed that there were no increased safety. There were very few reasons to have concerns about safety or tolerability based on our trial, and I guess they decided more is better, and they went with the high dose, the 8-gram dose. And have you seen any side effects in those you've treated? Right now, we have in our, our studies a very uh, benign safety and tolerability profile. This tends to be the case with these monoclonal antibody treatments. Obviously, we have a long history of this. Um, and we all have to remember, it's very different than vaccines. Vaccines are inducing an immune response, and sometimes they can overinduce, and that's why there's all these concerns about side effects. We're actually giving these antibodies. We're substituting for your own antibodies, and you don't tend to get the same concerns and worries about overinducing the endogenous immune response by simply providing these inert antibodies on the outside. Dr. Yankopoulos, thanks very much for your time. I want to go back to Jen Ash. And Jen, we know that the president, according to the White House, said that he tested negative for the coronavirus on Thursday and then went out and, and did those events on Thursday. Mild symptoms reported this morning, now serious enough perhaps for the president to be going to Walter Reed. What does that tell you? Well, George, it's interesting because from other viruses, we know that a shorter incubation period from when a person is exposed to when they start to manifest symptoms can generally mean that the person has a higher viral load, meaning more copies, more volume of that virus inside. We don't totally know if that's the case with COVID. Um, but again, as, as you've heard, we've talked about it many times. According to data on all of the published reports of COVID-19 cases, 
about 80 percent of patients can be managed out of the hospital setting. Uh, to bring a patient to the hospital, obviously this is not just any patient. They will err on the side of caution, the president's medical team, uh, because of who this patient is. Um, but in general, when someone's symptoms progress rapidly um, and they feel that they need other services, more observation in the hospitalized setting, uh, they will err on the side of caution and admit someone. And, and, and it's especially surprising, as you point out, the president is not any patient at all. He's the president of the United States. He has a, a, an entire battery of medical equipment at the White House as well. So they, they, they're, they're taking this very seriously uh, at this point, in part also, as we've talked about, the president, 74-year-old man, and weighs 245 pounds. Exactly. When you look at the risk factors, as we know with the published reports on data of COVID-19 patients who are admitted, age, being a man, having a BMI of 30, which is the cutoff for obesity and above, increases the risk of complications. Uh, and then again, when you talk about who this patient is um, and the potential benefits of having other services at his disposal in a hospitalized setting, um, just in case in medicine, we always prepare for the worst, hope for the best, and take all the steps we need to so that, so that if the worst case scenario happens, George, uh, the medical team is ready to respond and respond quickly. Jen Ashton, thanks very much. Let me bring in Terry Moran, our senior national correspondent as well. Terry, hearing the president may be going to the hospital for a few days brings up immediate discussion of the 25th Amendment and whether if at some point he may have to say, I'm going to turn over some of my powers now to the vice president. And that is, George, available to him. It's why the 25th Amendment was written, to make sure that there are guardrails for situations like this for the president to choose uh, if at some point, uh, if the condition worsens and the president feels he is not up to discharging, in the words of the Constitution, the powers and duties of the office, then what he does is he writes a letter uh, to the House and Senate declaring that, and Mike Pence becomes the acting president. That's a temporary measure. He doesn't take the title or the office, but when President Trump recovers, feels better, he writes a letter saying that, and uh, he becomes president again. The, the hard part is uh, if he falls ill quickly and isn't able to get that letter off, what happens then? Well, then uh, Vice President Pence, under the Constitution, would assemble the cabinet, and if a majority of them vote that the president at this moment is not able to discharge the duties and powers of his office, Mike Pence would become acting vice president. So the Constitution has these processes for President Trump, for the, for the government to continue in a safe and secure manner. It's only been invoked for relatively routine operations for President Reagan and President George W. Bush. In fact, when President Reagan was shot in 1981, they did not invoke the 25th Amendment. They did not, and his physician later said it was a mistake because he was under anesthesia for a very serious gunshot wound. And that is one of the, uh, the triggers that has happened in these previous instances where it's been invoked, once by Reagan when he had colonoscopy and twice for surgeries uh, by George W. Bush. And what Chiefs of Staff has said is they, the question they ask is, is the president capable of making a decision? That's the threshold. And as soon as he emerges out of uh, anesthesia in those instances and seemed capable of making a decision, that letter reclaiming his powers went out. This is a different situation, unprecedented. Yeah, right now we have no reason to believe the president can't make decisions at this point. I want to bring in Martha Raddatz, our chief global affairs anchor. Martha, the president is headed uh, to Walter Reed, a facility you know well. Yes, and, and it is a massive medical facility. He will get the best care possible, not only for military doctors. Of course, he has a military doctor, but they will have any doctors at their disposal to help out with this in the president's care. Uh, you heard the White House say he will have a presidential office there. I think what they mean is a VIP room, which is set up at uh, Walter Reed, uh, but that's set up for any VIP that's there he can work out of there and he can also get treatment out of there but it is a, a very very professional hospital of course we have seen through the years dozens and dozens and hundreds and hundreds of soldiers and others treated there for wounds but the president will be treated for covid i know they have a lot of protocols in place already at that hospital for others who may come in with covid uh, but they will certainly make way for the president okay i want to bring in chris christine associate of the president former governor of new jersey 
Jersey as well. And Chris, of course, you were helping the president with debate prep through last weekend up until Tuesday, I guess right around noon Tuesday afternoon. So you were in pretty close contact with the president. I was, George. Um, we, uh, we worked Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, you know, a few hours each day, um, mostly in the map room um, of the White House. Uh, and then we also worked in the Oval Office a little bit. Uh, we were all pretty well spread out in both places. Um, I was probably, you know, three to four feet away from the president. I was sitting across from him, across a rather large table. But we were all together for, for you know, a number of hours for four days. Did you notice anything, any symptoms at all? No, no. He, believe me, he and I had, you know, some good back and forth preparing for the debate. He seemed energetic and, you know, ready to go. And I didn't notice uh, anything with him or with Hope Hicks, who was in the room as well um, during those times. They, they both didn't display any symptoms that I noticed. And, and, and Chris, of course, since you were in such close contact with the president, walk us through the process of how, how and if the White House contacted you through any kind of a contact tracing program so you would then go get tests yourself. I have not been contacted, George, by the White House. Um, I found out about Hope's diagnosis through media reports. Um, and obviously, when I heard that Hope who I had been in that same room with as well, um, had tested positive and was symptomatic, um, I knew that I was going to have to be tested. And so I found that out, I guess, about 9 o'clock last night when it was initially reported. Um, and I went uh, this morning um, to a center here in New Jersey um, and got a test and um, supposed to receive the results um, first thing tomorrow morning. Okay, Chris, thanks very much. There you see Marine One uh, on the White House lawn preparing to take the president to Walter Reed. I want to bring in Cecilia Vega for more on this as well. Of course, you've been covering the White House. This has been your beat now uh, all through this COVID crisis. And, you know, it was just surprising to hear Chris say that he wasn't contacted uh, by the White House. The White House also facing questions because the president went forward with that trip to Bedminster, New Jersey for a fundraiser and event yesterday in New Jersey after the White House had learned that Hope Hicks had tested positive. Uh, George, I just had a physical reaction to hearing Chris Christie say that he hadn't been contacted. We learned from the media uh, that Hope Hicks had been uh, in infected and tested positive. I mean, that just raises serious, absolutely serious questions about the contract, contact tracing uh, methods that the White House has been using. And, and you mentioned it, that big trip uh, to Bedminster that we know the president took, even though he knew that he had been exposed, potentially exposing uh, 100 some odd supporters there who've now been told by the governor of New Jersey to take the appropriate precautions in the wake of that uh, presidential visit. But this is coming at a time when uh, the polls show the majority of Americans don't trust the president's handling of the coronavirus. They don't trust what he's said on this. He has, frankly, mis misspoken, mistruth after mistruth uh, on how serious this virus is. You'll remember he told Bob Woodward he admitted that he intentionally downplayed the severity of the virus to Americans because he'd said that he didn't want to worry them, even though at the time when he made that statement, he knew exactly how dangerous this was. Um, you know, there are just serious questions right now about how I, I think forthcoming the, the White House has been and will be about the president's condition, about the, the lead up to it. Um, we are still waiting to find out it, it, exactly, uh, you know, w w when he, he was first tested, the White House not saying that. Uh, you know, there are also, George, we've been talking about this over the last four years, questions about the president's health. We don't have a full record, uh, a complete record of how healthy or not healthy he has been uh, leading up to this, just like he didn't release his tax returns. He's not been fully forthcoming about his own health conditions. There was that big mystery trip last year to Walter Reed that we still don't really know exactly why he went. And I just got to say, George, as a, as a White House correspondent, I've just been pretty astounded in the last, you know, 12, 15 hours since all of this broke, watching the fallout take place over the course of the day at the White House and still seeing, even as the president has tested positive for coronavirus, aid after aid addressing the media via vis a vis the American public not wearing masks today. It's been a pretty, a pretty astounding day so far. Yeah, and we're wondering what, at what point will the president's doctor come out and give a full briefing on the president's condition? I want to go back to uh, Jen Ashton for more on, on this. So we know that uh, 
people have come in contact clearly with the president since last Saturday, and at least uh, two other people who were at that confirmation, I mean, announcement for Judge Amy, Amy Coney Barrett last Saturday, the president of Notre Dame, Senator Mike Lee of Utah, have also tested positive for the virus. Several members of the cabinet have come out and said they've tested negative. But for someone who's been in contact with the president in the last 24 and 48 hours, an immediate negative test doesn't necessarily mean you're in the clear, correct? Absolutely correct, George. So I actually asked Dr. Anthony Fauci about this question after exposure to a, con a confirmed case of COVID-19. When is the optimal time to get your test? And he said day three, day four, day five. We know the average incubation period for this virus is 5.2 days. And we also know based on data that people who are pre-symptomatic can shed the virus and be contagious up to 48 hours before they themselves develop symptoms. So that would be the time to get your test, day three, day four, day five. Um, getting tested immediately right after exposure is not that clinically meaningful uh, and can absolutely present the, po the possibility of a false negative result. So contact tracing is key. We've heard from the beginning, critical to control this outbreak is test trace and isolate, and it seems like there are some big issues in the contact tracing department of that equation. President Trump, was, of course, was across the room from Vice President, former Vice President Joe Biden on Tuesday night at that debate. We learned this morning from the former Vice President that he has tested twice now negative today for the, the coronavirus. He's gone to Michigan for a campaign event. Mary Bruce is covering him. And George, just a short while ago at that campaign event, uh, Joe Biden said that this is not a matter of politics that this is a bracing reminder, as he said to all of us, that we have to take this virus seriously. He did offer his well wishes to the president and the first lady. You mentioned he did receive two negative tests today, uh, one from a doctor in Delaware and another, he said, by the former White House doctor who came up. Uh, that may be part of the reason why it took several hours this morning for us uh, to get an answer about the status of his own uh, condition. But, you know, it was Mark, uh, notable that during his speech just now, the former vice president kept his mask on for the entire time. And he implored Americans to wear them, too, saying, you know, this is not about being a tough guy. Those are the words he used. He again argued that masks are, are a matter of being a good patriot, looking out for your fellow Americans. Uh, and he did call for all Americans to have the same access to testing, you know, saying that it's not just people in the White House or those who travel, you know, with him or are part of his campaign that, that deserve to have that kind of safety and peace of mind. There has been a lot of questions about why Biden is back on the campaign trail today, uh, given that just on Tuesday, of course, he was on that debate stage with the president for 90 minutes, even though they were socially distanced over 13 feet apart, but they were not wearing masks. Uh, we have asked the Biden campaign about this, and they say that they felt comfortable resuming their campaign tra travel because, one, Biden tested negative, but also they say he was not directly in close contact with the president, and they say he was wearing a mask at all times during the debate except for when he was on that right, stage. And there was George. no encounter backstage between the president and former Vice President Biden? They have not said that explicitly, but they say that, that they, he, was, he was not in direct contact with the president, so that uh, is the implication they seem to be giving us, George. Okay, Mary Bruce, thanks very much. Let me bring Rahm Emanuel right now. Rahm, uh, you're a strong supporter of, of Vice President Biden. Is he handling this correctly in the wake of this kind of bombshell announcement from the president? Yes, I, I mean, I, two things, George. One is he's handling it correctly by obviously wishing the president and the first lady a uh, speedy recovery. And then also be reassuring and, uh, to the public as a whole, not just as a candidate, uh, an opponent of the president, but as an American. And I think, to be honest, that goes to his core point uh, of what he said, uh, you know, even when you disagree with me, I'm going to be your president. And his whole message is about unity, bringing the country together. And I think he's, if I hate saying this, given you're dealing with a, a health crisis or a health challenge for the president, he did, he did it exactly right for his message. I can only imagine now, looking at the helicopter there on the South Lawn, the battle at the, uh, between the medical team, the communications team, and the White House political team, that you have a president, the image of making a decision we're going to have to well, take to the hospital. And that's what I wanted to ask you about, because you're a former White House chief of staff as well for, for President Obama. This is about as complicated a set of issues you can deal with and the most personal set of issues you can deal with for a president. 
Well, you know, one of the things that any chief of staff doesn't like is when it, it involves what I call the East Wing, meaning the First Lady and family and et cetera. And you have the doctors and the medical team obviously made a decision that the White House is not good enough, God forbid, given now you have a fever, you have some conditions. I know it's all said as preventive, but this has an implication that the White House is just not set up for this. So we have to be at a hospital. Then you have the political team saying, do you understand that we started the morning you know, on our, on our own two-yard line, and this is going to put us on our one-yard line, if not worse. And they're weighing in probably saying, this is horrible. And then you have the family's own considerations, and, the, and in this case, both the president's black patient consideration. And so you, I've had situations where you have national security saying one thing, political team saying another. And in the end of the day, you can't really find uh, a weight of equities, and you have to pick one side of that scale or the other. And you can see with that helicopter there, the medical team won this argument. From a purely nonpartisan perspective, as a, as a former White House chief of staff, if you, if you can just put on that institutional hat, what should we be hearing from the White House right now? I think they, uh, two things. One is, uh, they, if I were them right now, I'd get the medical team and doctors as soon as the helicopter is up, I'd get them out with a press conference in the press, White House press briefing room to answer all questions. It will be a level of transparency that I think the country needs, and to be honest, the presidency needs and this president needs. So all three of those aspects need the transparency, and I would put a full medical team with a full report answering and prepared to answer all the questions. And I don't, and I think this is the commander in chief leader of the free world, the president of the United States, is being taken to a hospital because he's contracted uh, the virus. I think they, and I think that's the only way, because I think we all feel this, these are, I mean, just think of this week, Supreme Court nominee, tax returns, debate, and the president contracting COVID. That, and the week's not over. And so they need to calm the waters down. And the only way to do that is to get people that are apolitical to deliver a message a full, open kimono transparency. Jan Ashton, I know you want to weigh in on this. Yeah, I think um, what Ron just said is completely on point. You know, you don't just need to hear from the president's physician. You need to hear from the entire medical team. That includes infectious disease specialists, pulmonologists, um, multiple other specialists who are all consulting on his care, and a full debrief of all the evaluations uh, and his vital signs, what his pulse oximeter is, whether a chest X-ray has been done, whether his EKG is normal, um, what other medications they are starting him on, whether as a therapy or as a precaution. Um, and I think that we need to, you know, get to that step. And I think there are a lot of people, both in the lay public and the medical profession, who would be interested in that information and reassured if it is, um, you know, just a precautionary measure. Terry Moran, we've often learned after the fact that presidents had serious health problems in the White House, everyone from FDR to JFK. Uh, and, and even now Ronald Reagan as well. But this is the most serious public health crisis for a president probably since Ronald Reagan was shot in 1981. No question about it. Uh, the other incidents where that 25th Amendment has been has been enacted uh, is when there have been scheduled surgeries. The, this is the most serious condition that a president has faced since Ronald Reagan was shot. And, and there have been other presidents. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower had very serious heart attack when he was in the White House, uh, and there was no 25th Amendment at that point. So this is something to take seriously, but it is, it is important to remember most people have a, a do recover, and uh, the president gets the best medical care in the world. Uh, we are told, I should say, George, by the White House, that the president has not invoked the 25th Amendment to temporarily transfer the powers and duties of the president to Vice President Mike Pence. And that makes sense as long as he is capable of making decisions. Uh, the concern about this and the difference between this and those other instances is in those other instances, there were going to be scheduled absences, as it were, of the president's decision-making capacity, be under uh, Reagan and Bush were under anesthesia when they handed over the powers. It, it will be hard to tell, and it will be only up to President Reagan, uh, I'm sorry, to President Trump, uh, to decide when he feels he's got to yeah. focus on his health and not 
be president. I have to tell you, we don't we we don't know exactly what condition the president is right now. We've we've heard the description from the White House and the White House doctor. But Terry, it does make me think of the trajectory we saw of uh, of Boris Johnson, the, the British Prime Minister, early earlier during this COVID crisis, came down with symptoms, wanted to keep on working, kept on working for a few days, and then ended up in the hospital in quite a serious situation. A very serious situation. His father said that they almost lost him. It was it was a very very bad night and. Johnson himself has talked about that. There's one other aspect to that. Since he has returned, uh, many observers in Parliament and in the British uh, public are openly saying he is not the same man, that he is str still struggling with what is being called long COVID by many, many people who've had it, that his focus and energy might not be the same. That's a very common after effect. Dr. Jen could talk about that. But this is a, a very serious situation, not just in the coming days and, and weeks, but perhaps uh, one of the things the president would have to watch out for is what so many people uh, are dealing with, that long COVID affliction. Okay, Terry, thanks. Let me run our political analyst, Matthew Dowd. Matthew Dowd, of course, this is happening 32 days before the final votes of this presidential campaign, as millions have already voted. Yeah, and that's the other complicated part of this is we've never faced a situation like this in the midst of a presidential campaign when people have already started voting. We've never faced it. Ronald Reagan was two months into his presidency when he was shot, so this they weren't in the midst of a campaign. What happened with Eisenhower wasn't in the midst of a campaign. And so this is a huge difficulty, and it raises all kind of questions, not only, I know you talked about the Trump campaign, it raises questions for the Biden campaign, because I think the Biden campaign is going to have to take Take this on a day-to-day -day basis. I know they say they're going out there and campaigning. They're going to have the right tone, but I think they have to really watch this and decide what to do as this moves forward and see how the president does in the midst of this. And then it complicates everything with everybody's already trying right in the midst of trying to make a decision on who they want to be the next president of the United States, and they see a helicopter on the South Lawn. And you have this immediate question of debates. Right now, the Commission on Presidential Debates says that the vice presidential debate is going to go forward next Wednesday with Vice President Mike Pence, Senator Kamala Harris. The next presidential debate is scheduled for October 15th, which is just outside of the 14-day the isolation period for people who've had COVID. Well, I, I think they are saying that the vice presidential debate is going to be on, which I think as of this time on Friday is probably true. But things could be totally changed by Monday or Tuesday of next week in the midst of this. And I think every, every one of the people that are involved in this, the Biden campaign, the Trump campaign, the debate commission, is going to have to watch this and see how this unfolds to make sure the decisions they're going to make are reflective of what they want to see, what's going on at the White House, what's going on at Walter Reed, and make the best decision. So I think as of today, it's on. But there's no, you know, you can't guarantee that as of Monday or Tuesday that they make a different decision. Well, and I want to bring that back to Jen Ash and Jen, what is the right thing to do here? You know, the vice president uh, last saw the president, we are told, on Tuesday afternoon. They believe the vice president staff's uh, vice president staff has said that they believe that means he is clear, doesn't have to uh, quarantine, doesn't have to isolate in any way going forward. What, is, what are the best guidelines on what those who have come in contact with the president should do going forward? forward. Well, it's interesting, George, because we've heard a lot of controversy, as you know, in the last couple of weeks and months from the CDC um, going back and forth on what they recommend. Um, you know, that's another piece of information that I think would be very interesting and important for the American public to know. What exactly is the testing protocol for the vice president, for Vice President Biden? Um, are they being tested every single day? Are they self-quarantining at all? Are they keeping some some distance um, between their spouses or their family when they're inside in an indoor setting. Um, you know, I, I can tell you again, because I've talked to Dr. Fauci about this, um, you know, there's not one firm day that we can say, this is the day that if we test you and you're negative, you're in the clear. This virus is just too new, and we just don't have all that information right now. So we have to err on the side of caution, and that's why self-quarantining, if you've had a pro long close exposure for 14 days is recommended by the CDC and testing. We heard Dr. Robert Redfield say it emphatically. If you've been exposed, you need a test. He just didn't say when.
Okay, Jen, thanks very much. Martha Raddatz, as we wait for the helicopter, wait for the president to come and approach the helicopter, my mind is going back to that uh, ceremony last Saturday, late Saturday afternoon uh, in the Rose Garden when the president presented Judge Amy Coney Barrett. It was striking to see in that ceremony most of the invited guests not wearing masks, all of the military escorts wearing masks. Yes, all the military escorts who led people into the Rose Garden uh, had masks on. That is definitely the protocol for the military there at the White House. And on all military uh, facilities, they are supposed to wear masks if they cannot socially distance. Outside, a little different. If they can socially distance, it is okay to do that. You know, George, as I sit here and look at that helicopter, I can't help wonder how the president gets to it. Does he walk outside by himself? He'll certainly have to be with people who are in some sort of protective gear. Important Does symbolic he moment. walk out? I mean, this is a very vigorous president. I, I was struck today by the fact that we haven't heard from him at all. The last time we heard from him uh, was last night on Fox News uh, talking about Hope Hicks. And in that conversation, the president was talking about the military. He was talking about Hope, and he said she's fantastic and she does a great job, but it's very, very hard when you you were with people from the military or law enforcement, and they come over to you and they want to hug you and they want to kiss you uh, because we really have done a good job for them. I, I don't really know what he's talking about there. The last time there was anything with the military was on Sunday. It was for Gold Star families last Sunday evening. Uh, most people in that room where they had that ceremony for those families did not have masks on uh, and did not appear. Uh, uh, to be six feet apart, each of them. Uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was there. He has tested negative since then, his wife as well. Uh, but in that room, there were a lot of people without masks on that Sunday evening. But again, when he was escorted in, the military escorts did have masks on. Okay, and, and Rahman, man, let me bring you back in as, as Martha was talking about this walk to the helicopter, if it indeed is a walk from the, pre, from the president. Usually when he comes out and heads into Marine One, he often goes and, and talks to reporters on his way out. What, what, do you, what will you be watching for as the president uh, heads towards that helicopter this afternoon? Well, remember the uh, time he came back from Oklahoma, his tie was undone? and he was looked dejected and down. And we all interpreted, that was the first time we ever saw him without his tie perfectly and perfectly coughed. I think the question, uh, like both a medical and political interpretation will be, does he have the strength to make it from that helicopter, uh, from the basically walking out the map room straight to the helicopter? Will he, how will he salute? How will he get up the stairs? Does he have both the strength and this is a person, it's going to be an image and it's the first time we're going to get that picture of the president and the, uh, they said he had a fever, but how it's affecting him, it will both project medically and it will project uh, strength or not. And so that walk, I'm surprised to be honest, they didn't do a, uh, a car and they chose the helicopter uh, and all this. And given the delay or timing here, my guess is there's, uh, this is out of my field, but since I'm a spin doctor, so I'll say, say it has some medical precaution, this is not uh, reassuring that there's a delay here. And, and Cecilia, so Cecilia Vega, I mean, we, we had a lot of radio silence during the day from White House aides, although we've now seen uh, Mark Meadows, the White House chief of staff, came out this morning briefly, um, and you've, you now have this memo from the president's uh, doctor. What's your sense behind the scenes of how this has hit uh, inside the White House? Well, George, a lot, look, I mean, people are actually really worried on a personal level. I mean, these are, you know, small quarters behind a uh, closed door there in the West Wing. Uh, folks who were on Air Force One are in close proximity uh, to the president, to Hope Hicks. Hope Hicks is a, a valued aide who, who works with many members at the, the highest echelons of this administration. Um, and, and people had close contact with both the president and Hope Hicks. And, and I think people are really worried about the their own personal
personal safety. Um, you know, they, they do get tests. They've all been tested, uh, and hopefully that will alleviate some of the concerns. We, we haven't heard of any um, other high-level administration officials anyway uh, testing positive, uh, at, at least in the last few hours. Um, but, 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 but it's natural that folks who work in this administration would be really concerned about this. Um, I, I, I echo uh, Mark, Martha's and, and Rom's question about how we're going to see the president come out of this, because all I can think about right now, looking at this scene of Marine One Park there on the lawn, is that graduation moment from a, a few months back when the president appeared to sort of stumble walking down the ramp after after the speaking at a commencement, and he was so concerned about the public image that that presented that it became sort of a story of his own making because he kept trying to refute the fact that there was anything wrong with his health, uh, pointing out the images and pointing out the videos and offering explanations over and over and over again. And all of us who've covered him for this long now know that this is a president who is consumed with his own image and public perception of, as Martha said, his vigor and his health and his strength and his leadership. Um, and so this moment, uh, be it orchestrated by doctors or be it orchestrated by the president, um, will be unlike anything we've ever seen before. And um, and I, I don't know how he gets out of that White House and onto that helicopter um, right now and, and whether that will be an image that he wants America to see right now. And what it means for the president, if indeed it happens, spending a few days in the hospital in the month before an election. Uh, Melania uh, Trump has also tested positive for Cody. I want to bring in Mary Jordan, who's just written a, a book on, on Melania and her time uh, at the White House. We've learned a few details about her uh, her condition right now, also the condition of her son, Barron. Mary Jordan? I think her, 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 her phone isn't, isn't connected right now. So let me bring in Lee, Lee Wright Ricker from Harvard's Kennedy School. And, and Lee, I mean, for this to happen so close to the presidential campaign on the issue that's come to define the entire campaign uh, is is something we just haven't seen in presidential campaign history. No, we haven't seen it at all. Um, the closest that we've gotten is something like Hillary Clinton um, coming down with pneumonia almost exactly a month ago. Uh, I, might, um, I mean, a month to the state four years ago, and we saw how you know we saw how Donald Trump treated that. He mocked it. He said it's an example of you know not having vigorous uh, or uh, vigorous uh, physique or uh, stamina. So it's it's actually uh, you know there is a precedent in, in some regard, but we haven't seen something as large as the president actually coming down with it um, in uh, recent history um, whatsoever. I think the real challenge here is to remember, you know, this is a moment, uh, this is perhaps something that is to be expected in the end result of a president who's treated this pandemic like a hoax, who's really dismissed it. Um, and so didn't even flinch when, you know, we saw people from at his rallies get sick from COVID-19 and now has to face, essentially has to face the music and has to face the consequences of coming down with this while still trying to maintain a healthy kind of a healthy image to the public and also continue his campaign. Um, how that, you know, how that plays out is remains to be seen. It is such a dynamic situation. I want to bring in Matt Dowd for a little bit more on this. You said everybody doesn't really know how this is going to play out over the next few days. Even the campaigns don't know how it's going to play out over the next few days. We've just seen an adjustment from the Biden campaign, an announcement uh, that they've decided, at least for the time being, Matt, to pull down their negative ads uh, as the president is heading to the hospital. Yeah, I thought about that last night, and I, I thought to myself, that's what I would have done first thing this morning is pull the negative ads. You could tell in his comments today in Grand Rapids, Michigan, he only mentioned the president once, and that was to say, I wish there was a speedy recovery. He never mentioned him again through his whole talk, didn't attack him, didn't go, uh, lambast him, didn't do any of that. I think they have to figure out the right tone in the midst of this. I think pulling the negative ads, as you say, is a good thing. I think the other question on the other side of the thing is, what do you do as the presidential reelection campaign? You're not going to obviously have the principal for any time soon in the midst of this. What kind of ads are you now going to run or what, what type of campaign are you going to now uh, push through in the midst of this? And I think it's important to keep in mind this moment comes when Joe Biden has maintained a significant lead nationally and in all the key target states in the aftermath of that first debate. 
And so what we're going to see is that this, again, I don't think we know what's going to happen in the debates. I don't think we know fundamentally the impact of what's going on on the American public. And I don't think we know fully what exactly the campaigns are going to have to figure out how they're going to do and how they're going to adjust with this happening in the midst of a COVID crisis. So, Rahm Emanuel, how does the Biden campaign strike the balance right now? I guess the decision today was go forward with your campaign event, pull down the ads. Is this just going to be day-to-day decisions? Well, uh, yeah, it's going to be day-to-day as events uh, dictate. I would say that I might, this is a guess, not only they pulled a negative, I bet you they put their foot to the gas pedal on the, on the health care ad where Biden's talking about how personal it is for him. So it's both also not only the negative is down, what is the content of the positive? And I bet you in the rallies, he will continually repeat with a starting line about wishing both the president and the first lady a speedy recovery and well-being. And it is not only their well-being, but the well-being of the country. One of the best lines from his debate is, if you want to get the country moving again, we got to get COVID under control. And I think he will not only continue the campaign and make day-to-day adjustments both to remarks to the schedule, uh, but also to reassure people. Because remember, his core message is this is about the soul of America. This is about bringing us back together and remember what binds us as Americans. And, and, and Ron, and on, on that point, as we've been speaking, actually, yeah. Joe Biden just sent out a tweet, quote, this cannot be a partisan moment. It must be an American yeah. moment. We have to come together as a nation. Yeah. And so to me, this is where they're going to finally, everything's going to go I wouldn't be surprised if they said if there's another way to not just go to the health care ad. The question is whether they cut another ad that's a little more uh, about America nation, because that has been what people loved about Joe through the primary and here and the, and the vice president rather through this process. Is his tone and tenor was different from the president. And he struck a period of time that, again, we could be we could differ on issues without being di- difficult with each other. And I think he will constantly adjust and move towards that safe space that has been his ace in the hole from the primary to the general election to this. And they're going to make adjustments to make sure they're never offside, out of bounds on that effort. And they can never be called, uh, you know, for a five-yard penalty here. We That's where you, you know, this can flip quickly on you, and they're going to be very would stay within the lines and always draw in the lines. We have just heard from Eric Trump as well on the tweet. Ronald, real Donald Trump is a true warrior warrior who will fight through this with the same strength and conviction that he uses to fight for America each and every day. I ask you to join me in praying for his recovery. I've never been more proud of someone and what they have had to endure. We are coming up now on 6 o'clock in the east. What you're seeing there right there is Air uh, Marine One at the White House preparing to take President Trump to Walter Reed Medical Center there on the right side. As you know, at 12.54 this morning, the president announced that he had tested positive for COVID. Uh, we learned this morning from the White House chief of staff that the president had mild symptoms, but over the course of the afternoon, the situation appears to be, have become somewhat more serious. The president reported to have a fever, chills, and a cough, the classic symptoms of COVID. Also reported to be taking uh, an, an experimental drug from Regeneron, an eight-gram dose of an antibody cocktail. The White House saying it's a precautionary measure, and now the president prepared preparing to go to Walter Reed Medical Center perhaps for a few days. Uh, Jen Ashton, talk about the, 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 the course of the president's illness so far and what we can expect over the next few days. Well, I think the thing, George, is that this virus has shown us that we really can't predict very much. No one has a crystal ball here. Um, You know, we are talking about someone in their 70s, um, you know, with fever and chills. I can tell you when I have fever and chills, I don't know that I could make a a 50-yard walk um, by myself to a helicopter. Um, And obviously, I'm not 74. So I think that every patient is different. We have to understand that um, this virus can be really unpleasant. We've heard many, many reports about that from everyone from Boris Johnson to the average person. And uh, until it's in the rearview mirror, you really don't know what to expect in medicine. So I think that the treatment will be based on observation. Uh, There will be some aggressive measures taken, but also by the same token, some expectant and conservative measures um, in a hospital setting. So it's a very fine balance and it's certainly not robotic or cookie cutter or one size fits all in nature. One of the finest hospitals in the world, Walter Reed Medical Center. Rachel Scott is there on the scene. Can you detect any unusual activity yet, Rachel? 
Not yet, George, but we are seeing people starting to arrive behind me as we await the president's arrival here at Walter Reed Medical Center. And this is just a stunning turn of events less than 24 hours after the president revealed that he has tested positive for COVID-19. He is now expected to spend a few days here at Walter Reed Medical Center. Now, the White House press secretary says the president will continue working out of presidential offices. Multiple officials tell us that he is expected to be receiving uh, tests uh, every single day. And the president, while in self-isolation, has been working throughout the day, but he is experiencing those mild symptoms, a low-grade fever, we are told, chills and congestion. Earlier today, he did speak to Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who said he was in good spirits, George. I want to bring in our White Thank you, Rach. I want to bring in our White House producer, John Santucci. John, you've, you've had, had the chance to speak with Don Jr., the president's son. I did, Trump. I, I did, George. I just hung up with the president's eldest son, Donald Trump Jr. He told me he spoke to his father uh, earlier this morning, describing uh, the 74-year-old as in a good mood, um, uh, pretty upbeat, um, but said he did sound uh, a little tired when they spoke this morning um, as he quickly uh, turned the conversation to how things were um, out in the campaign trail. Uh, the president's uh, eldest son telling me that he's never seen his father sick um, in 42 years and uh, is hoping he's going to get back on the road uh, soon, um, but obviously uh, asking everyone to please keep his father in his thoughts. And, and so we've heard from Don Jr. We saw that tweet from Eric Trump. We should probably also note that over the last now more than uh, four years, five years, Hope Picks has really become part of the Trump family as well. Oh, no doubt, George. She is the adopted child of the Trump family. The president himself uh, often refers to her as Hopi. Um, and, and someone that, you know, for so long uh, has been in tow with the first family. Her office, up until she departed uh, the White House in 2018, uh, was the closest one to the Oval Office, just outside uh, the president's door. Um, and when she returned uh, this year, many aides in the West Wing and family members of the president uh, actually welcomed it as, as someone that had the president's trust loyalty in his brain and the secret weapon uh, of hope is uh, multiple sources have told me over the years is that she's the only one uh, that could tell him bad news um, which is obviously a very tough task for anybody in the White House and definitely a tough task for anyone that's been in the White House this year what do we know about how she's doing so, George, I've spoken to multiple sources that have talked to Hope uh, within the last day. I'm told she's doing okay. She is uh, exhibiting uh, symptoms of the coronavirus. She has been resting at home. Uh, you know, George, most of the White House aides that travel with the president um, are tested before they hit the road, and that's exactly what happened to Hope Hicks on Wednesday morning. Uh, she had joined the president on his trip to Minnesota. She had uh, passed uh, her COVID test. It came back as negative. Uh, and then as she was in the here with the president heading towards Minnesota, I'm told by sources that she started to feel ill, started to exhibit symptoms, and that's when she was actually uh, said she should quarantine uh, on board the plane. That's what she did. Um, I'm told that things, unfortunately for Hope, uh, did get a little worse after that. Uh, but she is at home. Uh, she is resting, um, and uh, she is, uh, you know, hoping to make a speedy recovery. Okay, John. Thanks very much. Go do some more reporting now, and, and come back when you got when you've got it. I want to bring in. Mary, Mary Jordan, who's just written a book on Melania Trump, uh, The Art of the Deal. And, and, and Mary, um, Melania Trump also tested positive that we learned that last night, has symptoms perhaps not quite as severe yet as, as her husband. And of course, they've also got to be concerned about their son, Barron, who's been living in the White House. And also her parents. Uh, there perhaps is nobody more close uh, to Melania than her, her elderly parents. And she has actually been caring for her mother, who was sick. Uh, so, you know, there's a, a lot of concern for a very, very close family, the closest people on earth to Melania Trump. And she eats dinner and lunch and breakfast. I think we, I think we lost Mary Jordan there uh, again. Let me bring, uh, let me bring Matthew Dowd back in uh, right now, Matt. As we see the White House, a crisp autumn day, uh, Friday afternoon uh, at, at the White House right now, waiting for the president to come out to Marine uh, One. Um, it, it, it's, it's hard to imagine more of a surprise coming in the final weeks of a presidential campaign. <laughs> We're all been used to, all, you and I, we've all of us have covered campaigns for so long. We're always used to the October surprise, but we've never been used to this kind of October surprise. This is, this goes beyond any kind of surprise that, that we've seen. And one thing I'll, I'll say is I'm willing to bet 
um, my Texas land, that the president walks out under his own volition on this, because I think he understands, as Ram was saying, he understands what that means if he doesn't. Um, and how much that is important to him. So my guess is he's going to do that. So this is a surprise like any, George. Um, you know, there's all kind of questions that it raises as voting starts in the midst of this, as we talked about his campaign, what the Biden campaign does. I'm, what, what, I mean, we haven't talked about it enough, but Vice President Pence, who's been in contact with Donald Trump, what does he do in the midst of this when the president is going to the hospital? He's on the campaign ticket with the president. He was in contact with the president. What does he need to do in the midst of this? Does he not campaign? Does he not go out? So that's a whole other question. Well, and, 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 and let's try to at least, at least at least try to answer some of them. I mean, the, the president, as you had pointed out, was coming into this uh, week behind a pretty stable seven point lead for Joe Biden over the last several weeks and months. Nothing seemed uh, to shake that. This brings the coronavirus front and center once again. Uh, can, can the White House team and, and the Trump team even mount a campaign at this point? Um, I don't think they can, actually. I don't think they can mount anywhere close to the campaign they thought about. But I, I think this is an entirely new territory for them, which may be actually good for them, because uh, the campaign they were mounting wasn't working. The convention they held didn't move the numbers. The debate strategy they had didn't change the dynamics. So maybe maybe not running any campaign um, is their best route to this, uh, you know, in any kind of scenario. But I think the problem the president has, and was mentioned earlier, is for somebody that has tried to discount co coronavirus, that's kind of downplayed, according to his own words, that has made fun of Joe Biden and made fun of people for wearing masks, for all his staff, many of little of who wear masks, to have the events that he has. For him now to be going to Walter Reed Hospital uh, with coronavirus, I, I think puts a huge, huge dent into anything that they wanted to possibly say in the last 30 days. Yeah, and Terry Moran, we were talking about Boris Johnson, British Prime Minister, earlier. He actually got a wave of sympathy in the wake of, of, his, di of his hospitalization with COVID earlier uh, this year. But the president is facing a much different situation, in part because of the, for the reasons that Matt uh, just mentioned, in part because he is right in the middle of a presidential campaign right now. He is when feelings run very, very high. Of course, everyone will want to unite and uh, hope and pray for his speedy recovery. And if he does, when he does recover, there could very well be a rallying among his base and a new argument for him. Look, I, I beat it. We can do it, too. He'd need to modify, I think, some of the, some of the language that he's used around masks and other issues. Uh, but uh, I've talked uh, today with uh, David Bossie, who is a uh, former deputy campaign manager of the Trump campaign, still very close to the president, saw him over the weekend. And he said that a campaign can go back to what they were doing during lockdown. Uh, that they did have the president on the phone uh, holding kind of virtual rallies on the phone, certainly not the same thing as the Trump show in, in a real rally. Uh, but in also talking to voters in Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, places I've been over the past few months, it sounded to me that the Trump supporters were willing to cut him some slack. Uh, as many voters are, about the original emergence of this pandemic. They saw it as an act of God. Uh, and now that he is, is, is afflicted with it, the question is, will that forgiveness, as it were, that, that understanding that I heard of talking to voters continue this deep into it. In, in a deeply divided nation. Cecilia Vega, I guess one of the other uh, quandaries for the president and his team is that it seemed like in recent days and weeks, uh, that since the convention at least, the, the president and their te team's entire strategy was to try to take down Joe Biden. That's what we saw at the debate uh, the other night. Tough to do that when you're in the hospital, when the country's facing this health crisis. Yeah, and they, George, wanted to do that takedown at these kind of mega in-person rallies that we were seeing the president do, and including, uh, frankly, in some of these hot zones. The president had been planning to hold two rallies this weekend in Wisconsin. That, that's in spite of the fact that the, the coronavirus task force had called these this state a red zone because of the high infection rate and these rising numbers that we're seeing there. Um, and, you know, with the, the polls that you just mentioned and this, this widening gap between Trump 
Trump and Biden. They were really hoping to try to close that gap in these final weeks of this campaign with this mega travel blitz that the campaign has, as of today, said that uh, they're going to stop all in-person uh, venues if, if they had planned to and either cancel them outright or turn them into virtual events. It remains unclear how they're going to do that if with this new development of the president being in Walter Reed uh, for at least the next few days. Uh, we also know on the Biden side, we mentioned this earlier, that they've, they've pulled negative ads. And, and I want to point out at the same time, our team is noting that the Trump campaign is still running attack ads on Facebook that are targeting Joe Biden right now. Um, you know, so it's I, I, I think the reality is both sides are, are struggling with how to do this, given the uncharted waters that we're in. And, and as of this morning, there were questions even about uh, the, the health of the Trump family, the top tier of the Trump family, and them having to potentially be in isolation. You know, these are the folks who are help running the campaign and, and even campaign staffers who had come into contact with the president as a result of that Bedminster event. So um, it's not just a function of can they hold these rallies for the voters and the Trump base and the supporters, it's can they actually physically do them if people who are running this campaign need to be in isolation. Let's go back to Mary Bruce. She's in Wilmington, Delaware, where now uh, with the Biden campaign. So we're seeing elements of the strategy coming together from the Biden campaign. Uh, the pre he went forward with his event today, pulled down the negative ads. We just saw that tweet calling for unity. Are you able to pick up anything more about how they're looking at these next few days? Well, the message coming from the Biden campaign is clearly to say that this is not political, that this is a moment for the country to try and come together and recognize that this virus is still a very real threat. That, of course, echoes the message that the Biden campaign has been making uh, for the last several weeks, while the president and his campaign have tried to argue that the country is turning a corner, as Trump says. Uh, the Biden campaign says, no, we are very much still in the middle of this. That message, they believe, is now underscored by the fact that the president himself has now tested positive. Uh, but to the point that Cecilia was just making, regardless of which side of this campaign you're looking at, the campaign trail as we know it is now fundamentally changed with just 32 days until the election. The Trump campaign effectively screeching to a halt. The Biden campaign having to completely, you know, or at least partially change their strategy. It is clear that they are still going to be traveling. Uh, Kamala Harris right now is heading towards an event in Las Vegas. Joe Biden just wrapping up this event in Michigan. Jill Biden was also on the road earlier today. So they are still getting out and about and talking with voters, still getting their message out. That message, though, is now being tweaked, of course, as they are ramping down their attacks and ramping up their, their language about the need for the country to come together. And, and their message, both before and after the debate on Tuesday night, has been that they're going to go full speed ahead with the debates. They're willing to go again, uh, despite what happened on Tuesday night, um, but that they're not going to go along with any change uh, in the schedule. That's what I was told by a, by a Biden campaign official earlier this morning. Do they expect the debates to happen? That is such a good question right now, and simply nobody knows. I, th I think the Biden campaign was still full steam ahead. The next face-off, of course, scheduled for just two weeks from now on October 15th. But the president's health and whether or not the president uh, is able to attend safely, uh, if he's even healthy enough, is the big X factor here. Um, there's, of course, also the vice presidential debate, which is uh, set to be held just next Wednesday. And while we know that the vice president, of course, has tested negative, there are questions, of course, about a need for isolation. We know that sometimes it can take several days after exposure for the virus to be detected. So whether or not we are going to see debates in the same timing that they were expected, in the same format that they were expected, uh, are all big ifs right now, George. We simply don't know. Um, and, and there are just too many X factors for either campaign, I think, to make a determination right Biden now. Biden campaign and the vice, former vice president himself been extremely careful uh, with COVID. As, as we talked about earlier, the vice president said he took two tests today. Should we expect that these tests are going to become relatively routine now? Yeah, and he has been regularly tested even before this. I would suspect that they will become even uh, more frequent. And it goes to just how different the two campaigns have been. Uh, as both of them have been ramping up their events, the president, of course, going back to those packed uh, campaigns. He has been uh, having a really uh, jam-packed schedule as well. Joe Biden, even as he uh, increases the number of events that he's been having, they are all uh, with a very limited audience, uh, making sure that everything complies with local guidance, the local safety precautions. 
precautions. He's always at a safe distance. You almost always see him wearing a mask, though sometimes he takes it off when he's actually delivering remarks. Today, you will notice he did not do that. I can tell you I've been at many of these events. I was just uh, with him earlier this week, the day after the debate. Again, you'll often see the press uh, uh, sitting in those little circles six feet apart from each other. They take this very seriously. And even when he is not doing events, his staff is tested frequently. There's a very limited number of staffers that are allowed to have close access to the vice president. Even if they've tested negative, they're all required to wear masks. They take this virus very seriously. I suspect uh, the, str the strictness of their uh, precautions is only going to increase now, George. Right. And, and Cecilia Vega, at the White House, they've been somewhat more cavalier about uh, masks uh, on, on a day-to-day -day basis. I would expect that will change now as well. Yeah, it's actually changing in real time, George. The the pool reporters, the group of journalists who cover the president on a rotating schedule day to day, ABC is one of uh, many outlets. Uh, to the, the pool reporters, anyway, are, are reporting that uh, the the team of White House staff who are out there right now on the South Lawn waiting for President Trump to leave the residence and enter onto the helicopter Marine One are all wearing masks, including uh, the press secretary, uh, other staffers who are out there. It, it goes without saying. Um, they usually don't wear masks. And, and I'll repeat what we mentioned this morning uh, on Good Morning America. It's, it's one of the reasons that cavalier attitude that many news outlets, including our, our team at ABC, have pulled back, at least in, in terms of a full presence at the White House, uh, for fear of, of the safety of our own team, because people were not wearing masks. We were not seeing social events happening with social distance on a regular basis. Uh, you know, you're coming into close contact with aides and Secret Service agents uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. You know this. I mentioned this earlier. The quarters inside there for the press, particularly, are not um, are, are not very big at all. And and so there have just been a number of questions about how seriously they were taking it. And of course, it all goes back to the, the statements that the president himself has made from inside that press briefing room, uh, downplaying the severity of this and and even turning the issue of masks into not just a political one but a campaign one, where he just as recently as the debate uh, charged, challenged Joe Biden and, and mocked him essentially for, for wearing a mask as often as he does. And, and there you go, George, you can see the, yeah, the, the, the helicopter now is getting ready to go. I, I think that's a pretty good sign that the president will not be speaking when he makes when he makes the walk to the helicopter. It wouldn't be possible really to hear anything he would say. But we have seen more activity now around Marine One. He's, he's, He's in the, in fact, now we're told he went directly to the helicopter. Our cameras were not there to see uh, him at that moment live. So he's in the helicopter now and getting prepared uh, to go to Walter Reed for examination, for tests over the next several days. And uh, he will have an office set up there, as we've said, uh, to do work and to continue to make decisions over the course of the time that he is at uh, Walter Reed. And as Cecilia and Terry reported earlier as well, he has not uh, invoked the 25th Amendment in any way, will not be turning over uh, any of the powers to the vice president as he's being treated uh, for COVID. Jen Ashton, let's remind everybody the treatment he is getting right now. He's received a, a, a single dose of Regeneron on their antibody cocktail, but also according to the president's doctor, zinc, vitamin D, I don't even know what this is, famotidine, melatonin we all know, and a daily aspirin. Jen? I think we don't have Jen Ashton uh, right now either. Uh, Terry Moran, it is quite a sight simply to see that helicopter waiting to take off knowing what's happening. It is, George. Uh, he is the president of all Americans. We are a deeply divided country right now, but that is our president, the one officer of the government elected to serve and represent all the people. Many people don't like the way he does his job. Many people find him a threat to the country uh, that he governs. But there's no question. The Constitution put him there. That's our president. And this is a, this is a very serious moment, given what we know about this virus. One can only uh, wish him well. Marine One slowly taking off from the south lawn of the White House, the president inside. We were told by the pool he was wearing a mask as he entered, wearing a suit and a mask as he entered uh, the helicopter. 
relatively short flight to Walter Reed Medical Center, Martha Raddatz, uh, where the president's team will already, of course, be in place, ready to give him the best care. I have to imagine, though, the president has spent time at Walter Reed visiting uh, wounded soldiers. I have to imagine uh, this feels like a blow, though, to him, Martha, coming in these waning days of a presidential campaign. It, it, it has to feel like such a huge blow. And again, this is a man who is vigorous. He counts on that energy. He does not like to be seen in any way as weak. And you can see the helicopter. I, I think it'll be there in a matter of moments. It's in Bethesda, Maryland. And for those viewers who don't know exactly where Bethesda, Maryland is, it's very, very close to Washington, D.C., just over the border. So he should be there quite quickly. I'm sure the doctors are standing by. I'm sure they have the VIP headquarters, is what it is called there, at Walter Reed, set up for the president. So if he can do work, he will do work. Again, very unusual that we haven't really heard from the president today and so little information coming from the White House. And you, you have to believe that Americans right now for the last hour and a half have seen that helicopter sitting there with so little information about this. COVID, of course, has been the campaign issue for Joe Biden. I honestly can't imagine, George, some of these debates going forward at all, even the vice presidential debate, because as, as Matt and Cecilia have pointed out, it's about tone. It's about tone. And what do you say? if you have it's, a president. It's, it's almost impossible to imagine at, at this it, point. It really is. And Martha, we've seen outpourings of uh, good wishes for the president from leaders all around the world, but also behind the scenes, uh, I would assume at the Pentagon, some concern, will any of our adversaries try to take advantage of this moment? You know, George, there there is a, a minor bit of concern, but there are systems in place. They do not feel vulnerable. I've talked to some very senior military officials today who said everything is normal, everything is in place. But I will also tell you that social media has many things that are not true going on on Twitter about, you know, launching doomsday aircraft and things like that. So those rumors uh, we certainly don't want out there because that they're not true. Uh, things are going on as normal. There are not concerns right now for national security. North Korea is not going to suddenly launch a missile or, or Iran try to take some move uh, while the president is uh, in the hospital because these systems are in place. You can see the, those, both of those helicopters now uh, flying very close to Walter Reed now. I would say just judging from what I can see uh, the tree line there. He should be there very, yeah, very soon. It is a in fact, very, very it looks like they're just about landing there at Walter Reed. A really massive, massive facility with some of the best doctors in the world. And he will have at his disposal, of course, any doctors he probably wants, any specialists in this. Uh, the Secret Service also. George, we have to talk about the Secret Service. They have been with him for days. And there uh, we see Martha. Let me interrupt you now because the, there is the picture earlier of the president walking out to the helicopter wearing that mask. Thumbs up from the president. His signature sign right there in a small wave. And I suspect very much he wanted that picture walking himself. To Absolutely. the helicopter with those masks on, and you see all the staff around him, of course. They are protecting themselves as well, uh, and the president, by wearing a mask, protecting them. Jen Ashton seems to be walking relatively comfortably up those stairs as he was heading into Marine One. Uh, but as we were discussing, and we all know, some from personal experience, this can't take so much out of you. Oh, absolutely, George. Anyone who's ever had a virus with a fever, uh, typically when you get chills in the setting of a viral syndrome, it is accompanied with a high fever. That makes people feel incredibly weak. Um, there can definitely be changes in the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system with that. With a person who's been lying down all day suddenly has to get up and walk um, can be really, really difficult. Um, it, it is pretty surprising um, that that someone of this age um, you know could could handle anything like this as I said before I could tell you I probably wouldn't be um, walking if I were in that condition uh, it just really really takes a lot out of you there again we see the pool camera of the president walking to Marine One 
just a few moments ago. He's just about to land now at Walter Reed. Uh, John Carl now in place at Walter Reed. Can you see the helicopters? I can see uh, I can see Marine One headed this way. I am right across the street from Walter Reed. Uh, looks like he'll be landing momentarily. George, as you know, the White House, uh, in the very little bit of information we've heard, uh, the statement from the press secretary says that he will be here for a few days working out of what they call the presidential offices uh, here at Walter Reed. And I can now see the, uh, the, the helicopter coming into view quite clearly. And John, have you gotten, been able to get any other indication from the White House as we see the helicopters preparing to land there uh, about what more information we will be getting from the president, his team, his doctors? George, the thing that we have asked for repeatedly is information directly from the doctors, a briefing directly from the doctors. Uh, we have the statement uh, that, that, that you've discussed, this is the second statement from his doctor explaining um, uh, what exactly he has taken in terms of this um, antiviral cocktail. Uh, but very little information beyond that, uh, really no official information beyond that. And the challenge here, George, is that uh, as we get statements from the president's press secretary, uh, you know, the, the, there's just a real question about the reliability of the information, given that they have not been particularly transparent, especially on issues of the president's health, but on other issues as well, which is why the request that's being made uh, uh, by me and by so many other reporters is to get official information directly from the president's doctor. And here, as you can hear, sound of Marine One, it is uh, just about to land. Marine One about to touch down at Walter Reed Medical Center. President Trump is inside. As we've said, he's preparing to spend a few days, according to White House officials, to be treated for COVID-19. Melania Trump, the first lady, of course, also tested positive. She stayed back at the White House. John said, we have not heard beyond these paper statements from the president's doctors what more they can tell us about his condition. Um, but we do know that they would not be taking this step if they didn't have to, if it wasn't absolutely necessary in their mind at this point for the president to be in a hospital setting, to have access to the world's best doctors and the best equipment, as we see everyone crowding around. We're not really sure what exactly we're going to be able to see of the president as he walks inside. And it brings to yeah, mind... George, are you still here? Go ahead, John. Yeah, yeah, George, uh, it, it, it's quite a scene here. As, as I mentioned to you, I'm right across the street from Walter Reed. Uh, crowd of people across the way. As word got out that the president was heading here uh, to Walter Reed, you have people coming over to try to catch a glimpse. Obviously, uh, the view quite blocked. But what a sight to see Marine One uh, essentially medevacking the president of the United States uh, here to the Walter Reed Medical Center. Uh, we saw him uh, walk to the helicopter uh, on his own, uh, but, uh, but, but still quite a scene, essentially a medevacking of the president of the United States. What a year 2020 has been. It began with impeachment for the president, the pandemic, racial riots and protests in the streets over the course of the summer, and now President Trump heading into Walter Reed Hospital to be treated for the coronavirus. We're going to move now to World News Tonight with David Muir. Stay with us. This has been a special report from ABC News. News coming shortly before 1 a.m. What you're this seeing morning, there right there the is Air, uh, Marine One at the White House preparing to take President Trump to Walter Reed Medical Center there on the right side. As we know, at 12.54 this morning, the president announced that he had tested positive for COVID. Uh, we learned this morning from the White House Chief of Staff that the president had mild symptoms, but over the course of the afternoon, the situation appears to be, have become somewhat more serious. The president reported to have a fever, chills, and a cough, the classic symptoms of COVID. Also reported to be taking uh, an, an experimental drug from her.